Thank you so much to Ruth and also to Chuck and to the other people who made it possible for me to be here tonight. Cable access has a very special place in my heart. All of the work that I've done both as a journalist and as a scholar is related to the power of communication in a democracy and the importance of exercising freedom of speech in order to make sure that democracy has a chance to be able to operate. Uh, and in that uh, in that work, cable access has been terrifically important, and I guess you probably know as contributors to that that Fairfax uh, public access is a real shining light. Uh, it, it, uh, it showcases an enormous amount of talent and an enormous amount of, of, of Fairfax County's diversity. It's, a, it's a, a, an exciting example of what cable access can be. So it's exciting for me to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to be talking, you to, talking to you tonight about a, a, a relatively unfamiliar part of copyright law. Copyright is a monopoly uh, right given to people who make stuff that makes, that makes, it requires anybody else who uses their stuff to ask for permission. So what I am going to talk about today is a whole other part of copyright law and the fact that people know this part of copyright law so well and they really are not as familiar with the other part of copyright law makes it difficult to use the whole of copyright law. So what I'm here to do is to explain the other part of copyright law so that the next time somebody says what's copyright, you'll, you'll be able to say, well, it's a collection of rights that offers, um, uh, that offers incentives to creators to make new culture. And I'm going to explain how that is. Okay, so here's what I think we're going to do tonight. We're going to talk about core concepts in copyright. Uh, we're going to talk about this notion which is absolutely key to interpreting fair use of transformativeness and what that means. That's a legal term uh, and it's a really important term for you to understand uh, if you want to interpret fair use. So we're going to go over that. We're going to talk about why these codes of best practices, which is what I've been involved in doing for the last 10 years with a, with a legal scholar, uh, have worked so well and why they might be useful to you. And finally, we're going to go to your questions. There's something I should tell you as well. I am not a lawyer, and I cannot give you legal advice. If I were a lawyer, I could also not give you legal advice because you would not be my client. And, and that's two different bad things that could get you in trouble with the law to do. I can only do the first one because I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but uh, the reason that I'm explaining this stuff to you is that um, what we have shown very successfully over the last decade is that it is possible for non-lawyers to interpret this law and this part of the law just as they interpret the laws that give them the rest of their First Amendment rights without a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. So you don't really actually need a lawyer for a lot of your issues. Okay, so going back to the, question, the purpose of copyright, which I started out with. The purpose of copyright is actually a very simple purpose. And the purpose in this country, the purpose of copyright in other countries is different, but we're only focusing here on US law. Um, the purpose in this country is to create incentives for people to make culture in this country. Now, culture can be lots of different kinds of things. It can be teaching a class. It can be making curriculum. It can be making a cable access show. It can be writing a book. It can be, it, it can be uh, making, uh, uh, writing a song or singing a song. Um, but the notion of why we even have copyright, which was highly contentious when we were forming this country. This country was built as a country hostile to monopoly. Monopoly was for elites. Monopoly was the kind of thing that we had fought to get rid of by separating from England. The last thing we wanted was to build monopolies into our constitution. So why did we write a monopoly privilege for a few, that is to say people who've created culture, into our constitution? We did that because we were a dinky little country on the edge of nowhere and an English-speaking country. And there was another English-speaking country where if you were a book author, you could go there and publish your book and get a lot of monopoly rights. That was England. And the goal was to have people 
make culture here and spread culture widely without limitations, but have a small part of the law privilege book authors and only book authors because there was already such a law in England and people were afraid that otherwise people who might write books would go back to England and write them rather than write them here. So you, I'm telling you that so that you can see the importance of the basic notion of <laughs> we want people to make culture. And very, very important in the notion of people making culture was that people had to share culture to make culture. That was the way you got to be an educated country. They were also really worried about something else. They were worried about national identity. This was a country without a telephone, without a telegraph, without the internet. How did people even know they were in the same country? Well, they got the news very slowly on, on mules and donkeys and carrying newspapers. Um, and so care, is spreading the sh widely sharing news, we had special regulations written into our postal service that would, would underprice the cost of carrying newspapers because spreading the word about what was happening was so important so that we would all know that we were in the same country. But they also thought if the way to, for people to be inspired to make more culture was to share culture. So they didn't want to stop culture from being made. So they, they created a copyright law that said, we're just going to have a, a very limited monopoly for some creators of culture. And we are going to really encourage people to use existing culture to make new culture with the rest of our copyright law. So wh what are ways of l encouraging people to use existing culture? in order to make new culture? Well, one of the ways would be to have a really short copyright, which is what we had at the beginning of our country. We had a 14-year copyright. Well, now we have a copyright that is so long that it effectively is eternal from our perspective. It's, it's, cop it's the life of the creator plus another 70 years. So, you know, nobody's, gonna, nobody's going to find Star Wars falling into the public domain in their lifetime. Copyright is now much bigger than it used to be. Copyright is now, now affects plays and books and music um, and, and newspaper articles. And in fact, it, it applies to everything that is caught in a tangible form. And I see that you are writing something down. And that, excellent. Um, now, I probably own the copyright to this PowerPoint, but if you were to write some commentary on it, like, she doesn't, she doesn't know what she's talking about, that would be copyrighted to you until your death plus 70 years. If I take a picture of it, I'd be copyrighted too, right? Uh, the picture of it, the, the, the presentation. The, the, well, it, you might have a fair use argument for reproducing this, and I'm going to show you how to do that. But in any case, the point I want to make about copyright now, and this is all since 19, this is since 1978, the law was passed in 1976, but copyright until 1976 was also something you had to apply for, and that's no longer true. Now, Literally, your, your thoughts on that piece of paper are copyrighted forever. If any of you have children and they came home and you put something on the, on the, they, uh, the refrigerator that they made, that work is copyrighted to them until 70 years after their death. So, um, so everything is basically copyrighted. This is a really important thing for you to know if you're thinking about how important is fair use to me. There are some exceptions to what's not copyrighted. That if something was produced by a federal employee on company time and did not involve use of any non-federal employee time or materials, it is in the public domain. That's not necessarily true of local, <coughs> county, state governments. Um, and Copyright applies everywhere, and yes, it does apply on the internet. Everything on the internet is copyrighted, almost everything. Uh, so what? What in? The, so in the old days, copyrights, um, the balancing feature of copyright to copyright monopoly was there just wasn't much copyright. 
Not much stuff was copyrighted. It wasn't very long. Um, the, you didn't have these derivative rights. So who even needed to know about other balancing features? But there always was another balancing feature, and that balancing feature is called fair use. It's been around since uh, litigation that happened in 1850, and it was codified in 1976. But what fair use says is you actually have a legal right, and you, in fact the law encourages you to use copyrighted material that is still in copyright um, if, and there's the if, if it basically, the, the general version of the if is if you are adding value to the culture with it. Now, how do you interpret that? There are four factors written into the law which will not help you. I will guarantee they will not help you. I'm only telling you these because, because they are in the law and people will always say, well, these four factors explain fair use. But they really don't because there's, there's not a reliable way for you to decide how to balance those four factors. But the four factors uh, in the law that, the, that all judges are required to consider are why did you use it? What was the nature of the work that you used? Was it creative enough to actually be copyrighted? A phone book is not copyrightable because it's just a bunch of facts, and facts are not copyrighted. Um, how much did you use, and what was the effect on the marketplace for that original work of what you did? Now, there's a lot of ways to go wrong in interpreting those four factors, and some judges went very wrong in interpreting them, but here is the good news that since 1990 we have, and which is a while now, right? We have very consistent interpretation of what fair use means from judges. And that means that we know pretty consistently what it means. It, um, th we know, number one, that judges are very favorable toward the balancing features of copyright to monopoly. In other words, if somebody comes in saying, I used this work of existing copyright, uh, existing copyright holder, the judge is going to take it very seriously that you might have a case to do that. And the reason why that is, is for the second bullet point here. Um, because if the federal government created a law, like copyright for instance, that allowed private censorship, that law would violate the First Amendment. The First Amendment, what does the First Amendment say? Freedom of speech. Congress shall make no law. So everybody's right here. But the key part for us about the First Amendment, it says Congress shall make no law that inhibits freedom of speech. So it doesn't say you have absolute freedom of speech. You don't in the workplace, for instance. Um, but what it says is Congress can't make a law that inhibits your freedom of speech. And if, if you are unable to express yourself because a copyright holder can say, I don't think you should say that. And no, I'm not going to let you say that with my stuff. Then the copyright holder would be exercising private censorship. And I'll give you an example. Uh, the guy who made a film called Outfoxed, this was a long criticism of Fox News. Now, he, in order to do that, he had to quote pieces from Bill O'Reilly and from other, in order, in order to say, this is the kind of thing Fox does, and this is why it's not fair and balanced. That's his argument. Well, so Fox News is not going to give him um, permission, is it? Are they? Why would they? So if they're not going to give him permission, then what, um, then if they could go ahead and do that, he, they, would, they would be uh, exercising uh, censorship. But they couldn't do it because he knew his fair use rights. So this is why news broadcasts are seen to be a lot more liberal in terms of uh, use on the web. So this is a really good point. Uh, now, it, it's, it, here's, a, here's a, um, and I, and I want to talk a little bit about that, but and this is a good moment. 
uh, there are people who really understand their fair use rights very well. Large journalistic organizations which use fair use every single day, every single hour in order to do their work because they're constantly advancing a story. They're quoting from somebody else to advance a story. Uh, broadcast networks, ma major, major studios understand. Anybody who's making a documentary film uh, in, a, in a major company understands fair use very well. And the reason they do is they have really good lawyers who establish company policies that make it easy for people to use fair use. And they understand fair use very, very well. It's one of the reasons we have so little fair use law is nobody actually sues much on fair use because um, everybody likes their own fair use rights very much and they never want to jeopardize any of them by getting a bad judgment. Uh, so Laura, you'll never find fair use um, uh, lawsuits being led by a major media company. Uh, but and I just let me finish this. Um, so the good news is generally that, that fair use is very favorably looked upon in the courts. And those four factors that are kind of head scratchers when you have to knock them off one by one and decide how does your use count have been synthesized by judges in a way that makes it much easier for you to decide what you're doing. So uh, judges generally put a lot of emphasis on this question of what's the purpose is the first question. What's the purpose of your use? What, why did you decide to take somebody else's stuff? And what they want to know if you fair used it uh, is do you have a new use for it or are you using it for its original purpose? If you're using it for original purpose, the odds are good that you probably should get a license. You decided to download, um, you decided, let, let, me, let me put this in terms of a cable show, you decide that uh, the new Beyonce song is the perfect introduction to this week's cable show uh, because it's, it's, it's just your favorite song and you really feel like it carries the spirit of your show. And so you want to play her song. And plus what you know that all of the people in your audience for your show love Beyonce. That is actually very, that's beginning to sound like an original purpose. She actually made the song so that people would like to listen to it and play it. So that's not going to be a transformative purpose. But supposing a Beyonce song is playing in the background of a, uh, an event that you are filming, and what you're doing is you're filming it to show this, um, the, uh, this broad and diverse array of people who showed up at, a, um, at the um, Taste of Fairfax event. And th that song is not going to get taken out uh, of, of your show because you can't. Uh, it's not only that, it's actually documenting what happened at the event. That is a transformative use. You're documenting the event. You're documenting Taste of Fairfax. And you're saying something about Taste of Fairfax. You're saying, I found this very interesting at Taste, because otherwise you wouldn't have filmed that part. Um, and so, and so th to the extent that you can say, I have some new reason to use this material, you're going to be in a very comfortable place for, um, uh, for a judge, and therefore, in a comfortable place for the people who would threaten you or possibly sue you because they know they don't have a case. Uh, but in order to be happy, you want to go to the second question, which is the other question that judges really stress, which is, did you use the appropriate amount? Because the appropriate amount will say whether you, your use, or will also dictate whether your use is transformative. Um, do you want, in the case of going to Taste of Fairfax, I have no idea whether there is one, I'm just making this up, but say there, at your Taste of Fairfax event, are you going to show the performance from start to end and are you going to focus on the performer? Because if so, it starts to look like a filming of a performance and then both the performer and the songwriter and possibly other people will have copyrights that they will say, I never gave you permission to film my concert and show it. Um, so then it really, then even though you would say it happened at Taste of Fairfax, 
you would be moving into a non-transformative use. So um, is that making sense to people? Uh-huh. Well, I can understand the, purpose, the new purpose, new context, new insight. But could you elaborate on the on the audience part, just because you have a new audience, it might be? I don't think a new audience is uh, necessarily a transformative argument be, because oftentimes the original, the original uh, uh, creator who owns the copyright is looking for new audiences as well. So. Th that's still within the, the basic logic. The question is, what are you doing with it? It's not what you did to the actual material, by the way. It's the context into which you put the original material. The material can stay exactly the same as it was, but the question is the context. You've all seen remixes, right? So remixes are a really good example of recontextualizing existing material and then putting it to a new use. And I can see where we got a whole bunch of questions, but I'm just wondering, I think I need to run through this so that you, I do not keep you all evening. Okay, so here are some examples of remixes, of, of transformative uses. Uh, say you're, you are film, you are showing examples, the, 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 the high school students, uh, and this happens a lot with educational access, they had a competition and you have the top three winners of, of you know, what their videos were, you had them do a remix. Do you, uh, sometimes the school will say, well, we can't let it out of the classroom because educational rights are limited. And they are correct that educational rights are limited. Educational rights to use copyrighted material are extremely ample so long as they occur within the four physical walls of a classroom and they do not extend to the hallway of the school itself. So that at that point when you would like to show other people and the students would all like to show everybody what they did, you you really have to turn to fair use and say what does fair use permit me? And so this is this is actually a point at which this is why it's important for you to know the law so that you can tell the high school teachers and the students as well. Okay, so and then video clips from a recent concert, we just talked about that. Um, you're going to be there. Uh, somebody's putting on a play. There's a community playhouse play, and uh, there's going to be a poster with all those images on the poster are copyrighted, uh, and it's right behind you. Is that okay? Yeah, it's a talk show where you're talking about the play. Um, it's not advertising the play. Somebody actually paid royalty rights to reproduce the poster, but for you, because you are doing a new show about the play, you're fine. Logos. Now we're going to talk about logos. Uh, logos are actually an, a separate issue. I stuck it in here, but it doesn't. It's not actually a copyright issue at all. Does anybody know what what issue it really trademark, is? Trademark. It's trademark. It's trademark. Thank you. Yeah. Trademark law is incredibly limited, and you only need to worry about trademark law really in the in the context of competition for that same thing. So. Morgan Spurlock made a whole movie about uh, McDonald's, and it was called Super Size Me. And he has McDonald's logos, he has McDonald's burgers, he goes into McDonald's every, every, every two minutes in that movie, and none of that matters because he is not making a competing burger and claiming that he's McDonald's. So all that pixelation you see on all the cable shows, that is fair use stupidity. That, that is, people not getting them <coughs> not getting a good education and it, and it happens really because somebody at some point uh, says to the intern get all this stuff cleared and you know we can't have it you know we, we don't want we have to get permissions for everything because they don't know the law and the intern does it and then the intern says to the next intern you do this and pretty soon that person is a production assistant and then you know sooner or later they're the person telling everybody yeah pixelate all those logos but but you breathe easy. Those people who are walking around in front of your camera at Taste of Fairfax with logos all over their shirts, it's fine. Okay, uh, now some things that are not transformative and are not even fair use. Uh, some of you might be showing them, actually I don't know whether this happens on Fairfax, but some, on some cable access stations they actually run whole movies that are available on Internet Archive. Well, Internet Archive has available movies that are actually in the public domain. If they're in the public domain, there's no copyright left in them, 
you're fine, go for it, do whatever you want with it. Another area that is not in fair use because it's for a different reason is all that stuff that's on Creative Commons. Creative Commons is a, is a blanket license that somebody who makes something gives to anybody who wants to use it. And there are some conditions you can attach to it. But if you find Creative Commons music, or if there's a Creative Commons text, or if there's a Creative Commons, there's a lot of Creative Commons images, like you need a sunset. You might want to turn to a Creative Commons sunset. Um, that stuff is OK, because Creative Commons is actually a license. It's a license to go ahead and use it. So they already gave you permission. The reason you don't need to use fair use or worry about it is because you have permission already from the copyright holder. Uh, and something that is not transformative is the school play. Showing the whole school play on your channel because it's not a transformative use. Because the school play was licensed in order to show it at the school. It's going to be licensed wherever it's shown if what you're doing is showing people a performance of the play so that they can watch a performance of the play. If what you're going to do is pull out a segment of the, sh of the, of the, of the show to say, this, the, you know, this happened at the high school this week, great, that's a news clip. And then you're going to ask not only, now you know it's transformative because you're telling people about it, and your second question is? Amount. Right. You're going to say, how much am I showing? Am I showing so much that, that they don't need to worry about ever watching this play because they've already seen it? Because that would be too much. OK. So there's another question that judges ask um, when they ask about, is it transformative and is it the appropriate amount? And what they say is, what do people do in this community where, where, of, of practitioners? When people, now you, you make cable access shows, right? So what, what judges would say is, well, these people who make programming, they make television programming, um, and they make films, what is it that, what is it that they, why do they, why do they need stuff, and what do they do when they need it? So that is where you get the idea of best practices codes, which are, synthesized decisions of people in a creative community about what they think is the best interpretation of the law. So there are a number of codes. They're all at the uh, Center for Media and Social Impact website, which you are going to get a link to. It's cmsimpact.org, cmsimpact.org, and I will show this to you. Um, and if you wanted to go right there, you'd go slash fair use. Um, and if you could spell my name, you could just put in Elfter Heidi and fair use, and you'd be done too. But um, the, the people who make documentary films, people who make online video, people who teach media literacy, librarians, and journalists have all created codes of best practices. And you could use any of these, depending on your practice, to tell you what is the logic of fair use in that community, what's the reasoning people go through in the most common situations. So possibly the most useful one to you is the Documentary Filmmakers Code. It's also the one that's been around the longest. And every one of these codes is organized not around legal specifics, but about what are the situations that you encounter most commonly in this field, so where you would need fair use. So the four situations that documentary filmmakers identified is, number one, we are talking about some piece of media. Now, that would be like fair use, I like, like outfoxed. We're talking about some piece of media. We want to critique it. We want to, we want to praise it. We want to do whatever with it, but, but we, need to, we need to talk about it. We want to say, this is, this is the most popular song this week. It's a Beyonce song. Then, then we, need to, we need to refer to it. Of course, we don't need to play the whole Beyonce song, do we? No, we don't. Because what we're saying is, this is the most, if it's the most popular song, probably people just need a little bit of it to get the idea. So the second one is, we. So, so a little bit is 10 seconds, 15 seconds. It's, it's like a no? myth. Because the most important thing is the logic. It's the thinking people do about why am I using this? And why did I use the amount I did? That's what judges will be looking mm -hmm. for. That's what anybody will be using. 
as their standard. So these 10 minute, 10 second, 30 second, 400 word things have all been created as rules of thumb by some corporate lawyer to say, um, in this highly constrained situation that you're working in here, uh, that's, that's a good rule to me. And then they leak out of that constrained situation and pretty soon people are inventing crazy numbers. So in just one second, I want to go through the four situations. The four situations are, I'm talking about a specific piece of media. I am illustrating a trend, a, 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 an issue, a point of view. I'm using three examples of something to say this is common in this, or, or a, lot of, a lot of media talked about this, this arrest when it can't, happened. Um, a third thing that happens when I make documentary films is I, I caught the music in the background. There was, an ele there was elevator music in the elevator. The, somebody was, the television was on in the cafe. What am I supposed to do? Um, and the fourth example is I'm using historical material um, in to, to illustrate that something happened in history. So the, this code, which I'm not going to go through with you, goes through what are, the, what are those situations? How would, what do, let's describe that situation. Second, does fair use apply to that situation? Fair use applies in all four of those situations. And what are the limits? When do I know it's too much? So when you read that, you're in a good position to know how much, how, am I comfortable with this? And if you were to take that, if you were to take your piece to a lawyer, you would need to explain to a lawyer. The lawyer could not tell you it's okay or it's not okay. What you would have to say to the lawyer, why did I do this this way? Why did I pick that? That's what the lawyer would ask you. So you might as well know that. If this lady has a question that you want to get. Yeah, so we talked about video and music. Um, do the same rules apply to images? So if we okay, beautiful them. question. Fair use applies to all media, and it applies to all formats. And the same questions apply every time. So yes, it applies to music, it applies to images, it applies to everything that is, that is copyrighted. And with the same logic. Sorry, I want to extend that question there. So, people, uh, like um, celebrities put stuff on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, mm -hmm. and stuff. So, really? using that on our show, it's, you know. Acceptable? It, it's acceptable, yeah. It's on the internet. So, can somebody answer their question? Okay, is it okay to use social media on, on your show? It was transformative. So what Chuck said is he wants to know why you're using it. And he wants to know, what else do you want to know? Uh, how, how much are you using? And you, you might use 100% if it's an image. And do you have a reason? Because that's what a judge would ask. Do you have a reason? Because you're, in, you're building new culture here. You are a very precious item in the law. You are, you are a creator and a generator of new culture. And by the way, nobody says it has to be good culture. There is no, there is no taste rule applied in copyright. So, so long as you're generating culture, that's great as far as the law is concerned. So that's the question you're going to ask about social media. Now, there is a constraint in social media, and I, just one second. As there is in, in anything, um, you have a question of contract. When people entered into the social media, did they, did they enter into a contract that limited what they could do? That doesn't affect you as somebody who's using other people's stuff on social media to generate new culture. Yeah, in where, real quick. Where does giving credit come into play? I love that. Where does giving credit come into play? Let me just make a really basic point. Credit is absolutely absent from copyright law in the United States. That's not true anywhere else in the, in the world, almost anywhere else. And, uh, but it is true in this country that, copy, that giving credit is not in copyright law. However, <laughs> giving credit is probably the single thing that most people who made something care about. So what that means is that cre giving credit is actually really important. It's important because it pisses people off if you don't give them credit. And if they piss, are pissed off, they start thinking of things that they could do to you. And, and it's, it's, it's etiquette, it's decent, it's polite, and 
it's nice. So yeah, and really, I've never I've I've researched copyright and culture issues for ten years, and in ten years, I have seen one common theme of everybody wanting credit. There are many people who don't care about the money. Many people who don't need to be paid, but they do want their credit. And there's a co there's a Creative Commons license that does not require any credit, and it's the, and it's the least popular license. Uh, these are people who want to give their stuff away, and they still want credit. So credit is very and it's important for one other reason, because um, it's an example of your good faith that you're not claiming it's right. your stuff, and that makes a difference. Were it to go to law. Were it, to, were it to go to court, were it to have to be litigated, and again, the reason you care about litigation is not because this stuff is usually litigated. It almost never is litigated. Um, almost never, vanishingly small amounts of, of litigation here. But the reason you care about how litigation works is because that affects how anybody who might think about suing you <coughs> will behave, because they will know what the law acts. So the judges are human, and they, if they look at somebody who's behaved like a crass slob, they, they, they think less of them. So, so you, you know, that's another reason for credit. Okay, we have so many questions, but let me just see if I can get through this stuff. Did it make a difference to, to, to these filmmakers to get their code? Yes, it did. The most important reason that I can point to, that I can show, that codes of best practices make a difference in the practical world, even though they are not formal legal documents. They are merely consensus documents of people who make stuff. Is that at this point, unlike 10 years ago, it, when, when, which is when the Documentary Filmmakers Code was created, every single insurer for mis copyright mistakes, which is a required insurance of every documentary film, Every insurer now insures against fair use claims so long as they're within the, co the terms of the code. So again, these are, these are not codes that are going to tell you exactly what you can do. They are not going to tell you that you can you go up to 30 seconds or anything like that. What they're going to tell you is what are the principles of fair use? What are the limitations that people who make stuff like you think is appropriate? And these are these are leaders in their fields who made the decisions so that they are respectable to, to uh, judges and to, and to other people who make these decisions. And the, you need to own your decision. It's a reasoning process. It's not something where you can just slap it down and say, can I do this? Good. Okay, what about downstream uses? What, what about you make, the, you make the thing, it has a Beyonce something in it, and you're worried that people will sue you later because somebody else used it. Okay, what they do is on them, even if they did it in another country. What about you getting stuff from another country? The decision you make about copyright is always made in the country you're in. So it kind of doesn't matter where you got the stuff from. Sometimes it doesn't even matter if you got the stuff illegally. And, and again, the illegal thing is kind of about how, how judges would think of you <coughs> more than whether it's illegal. But, but the most important thing for you to, to know about using international stuff is that the same logic of fair use is going to apply to that as to anything else. So y you have access to some really great uh, Korean soap operas, and you would like to uh, show people an example of what the high quality, which is fantastic, by the way, of Korean soap operas. Um, and um, you don't want um, the, it were somebody to come after you, and there are probably distributors of Korean soap operas in this country. Um, they would be looking at that transformative question. Did you allow people to enjoy Korean soap operas in some way that doesn't mean that they have to buy the Korean soap opera channel? <laughs> um, or are you telling people about Korean soap operas in some way that justifies the amount of clips that you took from that to explain it to them? Even if you took a bunch, you would still you would still want to justify, you would want to have a solid argument. And I don't mean a weasel word, getting away with it kind of argument. I mean the kind of argument that, that you could honestly 
uh, say to somebody you respect, um, you know, it, uh, who doesn't really know what you're doing? Like you could explain it to somebody uh, who, who is not involved in this process and not have them laugh at you. Um, so the, the, one of the things we have seen again and again over the last 10 years is that when people start using fair use, they're like, oh gosh, I'm afraid I'm not, I'm not going to make this decision right. As they turn to their own, the, 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 these codes of best practices that allow them to understand how other people are reasoning, they gain a sense of confidence. And then what happens is not only that people are able to do their own work more comfortably, but they begin to see this for what it really is, which is a right on of free expression and a right that the law encourages you to use. So this is, uh, this is part of what makes it possible for you to do your work, and the law wants you to make, the law wants you to make culture. And when that happens, then people get motivated to tell other people about fair use and also to push for it. And this is where I'm gonna talk about the DMCA, but only after I tell you how to, See that, see that uh, URL? That URL is, is your passport to more material than you can possibly digest. That has all the codes of best practices. It has seven minute explainer movies for every one of the codes. It has FAQs for the codes. It has um, curriculum guides if you wanted to assign it to students. Um, what else? Uh, it, it has a lot of stuff. Um, Oh, it has, it has infographics, if you want to put it up on your Twitter feed. Um, also, we wrote a book. This book is called Reclaiming Fair Use. It costs less than your average vampire novel. <laughs> <laughs> I would bring it here and sell it to you, only Amazon is going to sell it to you for half of what I could charge you. Uh, it, it is a literal, it's an $11 book. Uh, and if you, um, it lays out the, um, it gives it, I think if you're a maker, you're totally happy with some of those codes. If you have to deal with a general counsel, if you have to deal with uh, a superior, if you have to deal with a, a board of education or somewhere, you'd like to be able to wave the book at them and say, this book has the entire case law in it that shows why this is okay. Uh, and the, uh, the version that you're gonna get allows you to share this, and the version of, the, of, of this that you're going to, the link that you're going to get will have this URL nicely displayed. I mean, this, this email nicely displayed. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you.